Awesome. Hey, welcome everybody. Calling all investors. Today is November 8th, 2022, and we're here live with Chaley Ridge uh, every Tuesday. <laughs> every Tuesday at 4.30 p.m. Eastern, we get together and we talk about stuff and um, we learned a few things. You know, we've been doing this now for 63 episodes, Chaley, if you can believe it. Wow, that. really? Has it really been that many? And we learned a few things along the way. Um, before we get into that, Listen, gang, you know the story here. If you ever need anything with regards to real estate, lending, questions, education, preparation, et cetera, just call a Ridge Lending Group, 855-74-RIDGE. And uh, you can email to info at ridgelendinggroup.com or just go online and apply at ridgelendinggroup.com. There's a ton of information that we're going to talk about, the things that we learned. If you have anything that you want to talk about, if you have a question about something Chaley covers, Got two ways to participate. First way to participate is to uh, go ahead and use the chat function within Zoom. Uh, you can also use a little emotion, emoticon thing to raise your hand. What you can't do is unmute yourself. And also, we figured out how to turn off that annoying little dinging thing, Chaley, so you no longer have to be worried, annoyed by those dingy things Thank logging you, on. Larry. Look at that. We're figuring stuff out. So anyway, uh, people are here to, to listen to you, Chaley. So we're going to have you go over a Schedule E. Yes. today because it's tax time and uh and have you get into that so take it away yes. Jim. thank you larry hey everybody good to see you um larry said we are talking about the schedule e so if you guys have been here before or in the last 63 episodes we've talked about this a couple of times it's really one of those primary very very important pieces to qualifying at least conventionally and in other loan products as well um because it can really uh, attached to a debt to income ratio in a meaningful way, both positive and negative. And I feel like knowing uh, what the mechanics are, the pluses and minuses of the formulas and the math really helps you guys um, retain and understand what to be prepared for on an annual basis. So before I start sharing screen and, and get into the guidelines of this, I want to remind everybody that if qualifying in any given year is important to you and you're looking to secure conventional financing or financing that requires tax returns, right? Income documentation. Um, I'm telling our clients this every day, at least once a day, I'm giving this, this piece of advice. We don't want you filing any more federal tax returns until we have seen the draft version first. Okay. The reason that we do this is we want to be able to set you up or arm you or prepare you to qualify uh, optimally for that year once that tax return is filed. Okay, the advice once we look at that draft return, and I'm going to show you the exercise exactly what we're going to do when we get the draft return here in just a second. That's what today's call is about. Um, but the advice that we're going to be able to give you as a result of looking at this draft return can be a multitude of things. I may come back or we may come back and say, uh, you know what, Eddie, this looks perfect. File your tax return. Or I might go and say, Jocelyn, I don't want you filing this tax return. I want you filing an extension this year. And I'll explain why that's a strategy in a second. Or maybe we need to look at carrying losses forward or, or, or. Okay, so we're, we're going to dig into that. I thought this was timely because we're closing in or closing out 2022. So Larry and I decided that we're going to do it uh, today, Schedule E calculation. And we're probably going to do it again in February, March or next year as we're really getting into or right before the, the filing, the first filing deadline. Um, okay, so let me share screen with you guys. Just while Chaley's bringing that up, again, I put it on the chat, but if, as you have questions, uh, for those that are just joining, you do not have the ability to unmute yourself. So sorry about that. Um, but uh, in any way, you can uh, go ahead and raise your uh, Zoom hand, so to speak, uh, in the chat, or just throw a quick question. I'm monitoring that as we go, Chaley. I'll interrupt as we have any. Thank you, Larry. And you know, while you're here with me, um, did you tell me last time on Zoom, there's no way for me to, to share this one screen. I have to pop back and forth between the documents, don't I? Yeah, unfortunately, um, that is the interface you're working with. Okay. So I might, this might be a little clunky guys, but we'll get through it. Okay. So we're going to start here. You should see on my screen an example schedule E. Does everybody see that? Yep. You're good to go. Okay. So Larry had to obviously redact some of the stuff and make it appropriate to share. Uh, this is just a, a typical Schedule E that we get from, from you, one of our clients. 
Normally what you'll see up here is going to be the word schedule E. This is where all of the listing of the, the actual schedule is, whether it's A, B, C, D. This will say schedule E over here in this left corner. And then the year in which it was filed will be over here in the right side. Um, for schedule E calculation in underwriting, we are gonna take the most recent year filed. So for example, if somebody hadn't filed 2021 yet, which is unlikely, but if they hadn't, we're gonna be looking at 2020, okay? Um, it's not a, a 24 month average, the way we may look at some other self-employed income or something like that. On the Schedule E, it's the most recent year filed. Um, okay, so I'm just gonna kind of go through what this is and, and some of the details. For those of you that haven't spent a lot of time looking at this, and even if you have lots of properties, I find that our clients really, you know, they send that stuff off to their CPA, assuming their CPA knows exactly what to do. And, and a lot of times that's true, sometimes it's not. We'll talk about some of those misses that we see a lot on, on our end. Um, but real quickly, this is what we're, we're, we're doing here. So there's three properties per page of a Schedule E. So for example, this particular borrower has nine properties. So there's going to be three pages of Schedule E, right? Three times three, three uh, is nine, three pages of Schedule E. So properties, and they list them in, in A, B, and C. So you'd have right here where this blue box is would be the property addresses of each of the properties. And these uh, rows here correspond with the columns A, B, and C down here. Okay, you've got income, rents received is here. Then we've got, you can see all the expenses, which are lines five through 19. These are the expenses. And then line 20 of the Schedule E is the total of five through 19. Now, all of this is gonna be important because in just a second, I'm gonna share with you guys a different screen, which is the rental income worksheet. Um, and we're gonna plug in some of these numbers. So you're gonna to have to trust me that I can see this on another screen when you watch me plug it in and then I'll go back and forth, okay? So we've got income, here's some of our expenses, advertising, travel, cleaning, commissions, insurance, management, interest, repairs, taxes, depreciation, other, right? So those are some of the things that we're gonna be looking at. Um, when we see other right here in 19, usually it'll be listed as statement one, two, three. These have these statements, so I want to take a minute and show you guys today, too, what we're allowed to add back in in some of these expenses and what we can't. Uh, we'll get to that. So, all right, let me unshare and reshare. This is lame that I can't just do my one screen. I swear there's probably a way to do it. I just am not smart enough to we, figure it out. I, I don't think we paid the big bucks for the Zoom. Really? Is that what it is? I think okay. it's all about the money, Charlie. All, all right. right. It always is, isn't it? Okay, <laughs> let's go like this. <laughs> All right, so now what you guys are looking at, this is a rental income worksheet. All right, this is straight Fannie Freddie stuff. This is a pre-formulated worksheet, you guys, that allows us to pull the data from the Schedule E, input it into these pre-formulated cells, and then it's gonna give us a, a bottom line result. So I'm gonna go through a few of these and plug in the numbers from the Schedule E I just showed you, and then we're gonna kind of look at which we can add back and subtract. And you can kind of see with your own eyes, those pluses and minuses real quickly, because this is available to any of you. If any of you really wants to learn this for yourselves, I'm constantly teaching my clients and then I will release a template of this and say, okay, here's your homework assignment. I want you to go ahead and take your draft and plug in all your numbers, then send it back to me. And then we'll have fun just grading it, right? They get a few gold stars or maybe they get a B minus. So, you know, it, it takes a few times to, to get used to this before they're really proficient. But if, if any of you is interested in learning this for your own edification, you just let us know and, and we're happy to send this over to you. As such, <clears throat> there is a top section. This is where the Schedule E comes in. This is the rental income calculation from the Schedule E. There is a bottom section that is the rental income calculation for the acquisition year. Now, I'm not gonna to talk too much about the differences today. The acquisition year is a very different formula. Um, very simply, we're gonna take up to 75% of the gross rents and subtract the PITI. Now, you will never have both of these columns with numbers in both places. In this column, it's one or the other, all right? So if you have, let's say, four properties on your Schedule E, but you just purchased two other properties, you're gonna start by putting the four properties on the Schedule E here, one, two, three, four. And then here in this column, you're gonna come down here and that's gonna be the acquisition year formula for that property, okay? So the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put a property address in here. And for those, uh, while you're typing that, Chaley, yeah, if anybody's interested in this template, I'll make sure when we do, when we post the replay, it'll be attached to the replay so you can grab it there. Thanks, Larry. 
Yep. So let me, I'm going to show you something else, you guys. I'm sorry I have to do it this way. I, I think I'm going to have to up my, my ante with, with Zoom so that I can just share one, like my middle screen. We will get okay. it checked out for next week. Okay, thanks, Larry. Okay. So you can see the schedule again. Okay, I want to just illustrate something right here. Fair rental days, because that's the first input that I'm going to have on my worksheet. So 365, obviously, this tells me, at least per the CPA or whoever did this, this return, that they're saying that each of these properties was in service for a full 12 months. Now, this is important because if you purchased it, say, in November or December of, let's go, 2021, then this should not be 365. It should be 30 or 60. And the reason that that's going to be important is that that's a formulated cell. I'll show you how in just a second. And we're going to share again. Okay, so far, far away, that first property we're going to say is 12 months. You'll notice I'm going to change this once we get down to the bottom and see what happens to the, the results if I make that two months or four months or whatever it is. This is very, very important to make sure your CPA gets that right. It's one of those common missteps that I find when I review tax returns that they just auto default to that 365. And if you didn't have any income for more than two months, right, that division of 12 months is going to be to your detriment. All right, so I'm going to take the first one here. The income that was received on that is 45,020. You'll notice that's just an entered. Now it's telling me to take the total expenses. If you remember, that's on line 20 of the Schedule E. So I'm going to subtract, right? These, this column tells me if I'm adding or subtracting, I'm going to subtract the total expenses of 31,566. Now, these are addbacks, insurance, interest, taxes, HOA dues if applicable. Depreciation is an ad. Any one-time extraordinary expense is an ad. Okay, those are the ad backs. The other expenses that were listed in rows five through 19 are not listed here on an ad back, but they're in this total, right? This is the total of everything from five to 19, but I get to add these back and I'll show you why in a second. So the insurance that they claimed for this property in that year was 2376. The interest that they claimed was zero. So what that tells me is at least at the time, this property was free and clear. Okay. The taxes, 8602. HOA dues. Now, I don't know if there's any HOA dues at this point. There is a line 19. It says other. So I'm going to continue to kind of go back and forth here with you guys so I can show you what I look for. Let's go back to the Schedule E real quick. Back to the drawing hey, board. Just yeah. a quick question, not to interrupt your flow, because um, I tend to do that. But in the screen share, do you do you not see the opportunity to share your entire desktop down in the in the options? Well, let's see, Larry. Did I I did I I don't know. Show all windows. Yeah. Okay. That may be the one. Uh, my, my concern is that might show every single monitor, uh, but there should be an option. I just can't test it while you're in the meeting, and I didn't want to interrupt your flow too badly, but in case it was a totally annoying. Yeah. Actually, when I hit show all, it just opens up all the other Windows applications I have open. It doesn't allow me to. It to doesn't yeah. allow you to select it. No, okay. I don't think so. Yeah. Just want to make sure to try to save you some struggle during this meeting, but we'll figure it out. Thank for you, time. my friend. All right. So here's, we're back on the schedule E. So like I said a second ago, row 19, we're talking about HOA dues that was listed on that Excel worksheet. So this property is showing other expenses of 4764. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to go find the statement. This is written kind of weird. Usually it'll say see statement one, two, or three, if those were the, the statements, but whatever. So I'm going to go and find my statements. I know where they are because I looked at this before. So here's the statement for property number one. So I don't see any HOA here. Permits, shared expenses. I don't know what that means. Plumber, right? So no, nothing there. We're gonna come back to this in a second and I'm gonna show you where you would put something that I can add back, but I'll get to that in a minute. So there's no HOA. Sharing again. Uh, HOA is gonna be zero. Now depreciation, this is a paper loss and I can always add it back. Depreciation is our friend. Make sure that you're not omitting things like depreciation because it will be Another thing to your detriment. So depreciation, <clears throat> excuse me, is 7208 is what was claimed. And now lastly, and you'll notice these are all ads. We're still adding any one-time extraordinary expense. Generally speaking, 
we want these to be listed on row 14, which is repairs. Um, sometimes CPAs, and remember you guys, CPAs don't know underwriting guidelines, right? How would they know that? Why would they know that? They wouldn't. We're often working directly with our client CPAs so that we can let them take a look under the hood and together we'll come up with a scenario that both maximizes the tax deduction and keeps the qualification in play. Um, but so going back to the extraordinary one-time expense, we like to see them in the repairs column, row 14, but if they're not there and we have a legitimate excuse, let's say for example, they put them into the cleaning or maintenance, or maybe they put it into supplies sometimes or other, they may put it there. <clears throat> as long as I have access to the paper trail, the invoice or the receipts of this one-time expense, then I can add it back, meaning it comes out of the loss if there was one. So <clears throat> a one-time extraordinary expense would be a new roof, um, maybe new carpet. You had to get the um, uh, furnace, furnace repaired, whatever it may be, but you have to think about it as a kind of an extraordinary expense. It's not gonna be landscaping, right? That happens continually. That can't be used as an extraordinary one-time expense. So if, it, if it's something that you know was one-off and you claimed it, of course, why wouldn't you? <clears throat> That's something, sorry guys. <clears throat> this is what happens when I've been talking on the phone all day. That's something that we can add back in. In this case, there is <clears throat> listed, <clears throat> wow, 74.44 is what's listed as a one-time well, as a repair on row 14, I'm going to assume, actually, you know what, for a second, I'm going to leave that at, at nothing. And I'll show you what happens when I add it back in later. All right. So we have all of our first numbers here. We have our adjusted rental income here. So this is this number minus this number. And I've added back in these numbers. And that's how I get 31,640. This is divided by 12 months. And it leaves us with 2637. The final, we've divided by 12, right? So the final step here before I can figure out what my gain or loss might be is I have to now put in the PITI, principal interest, taxes, insurance, and HOA if it applies. So in this case, I'm going to say that the PITI is 1850, all in. So this property is operating at a gain of 787. Okay. What if this number was 3,500? Now this is at a loss of 863. But let me illustrate a point. I'm going to add back in this one-time extraordinary expense and assume that the 7444 listed on row 14 of this tax return, I can show paper trail that it was one time. And if I add that back in, watch what happens to that eight, negative 863. I've just saved us about $600 in monthly liability. So what's going to happen with this, you guys, is we're going to do this every single time for all the properties that the borrower owes. We're going to get a net sum across this, this row here. It'll give us the answer down in here. And then I'm going to take this and in the borrower's profile, if it's a gain or a loss, I'm going to add it to the liabilities or I'm going to add it to the income column. And once I've done that, I'm going to wait to see how my debt to income ratio will be impacted for the remainder of the year once I file that tax return. Okay, so let me go back up here and uh, do a couple other things. I'm so gonna... we did have a question. Uh, hopefully, it's it's not breaking you here. So the question uh, Kyle asked: Would depreciation from a cost segregation study go into depreciation or one-time expense? It will go into depreciation. There you go. I mean, I guess it depends who. who I don't. I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. Who asked the question? It uh, depends Kyle on how, Kyle. It depends on how your CPA does it, but more often than not, I've seen it in depreciation. Um, Thank you, Joe. Yeah. So a couple other things, guys. Let's just uh, let me go through this math for you. So the reason that these are ads, right? Remember insurance, interest, taxes, HOA, if there is HOA on the property, depreciation is a paper loss. So I get to add that back. And then if it is that one time extraordinary expense, it's also an add back. The reason that I'm adding these back in versus subtracting them is because I am subtracting one twelfth of each of these in the PITI, the monthly amount, right? So if I get to add these back, the only reason I'm doing that is because I'm taking away here. I'm not going to hit you for it twice, right? You're getting hit. We're subtracting out of the net monthly adjusted. And that's why these are add backs because it's taken out down here as the final step to figure out what the gain or the loss is monthly. Any comments, questions so far? 
anyone has any questions, feel free to either throw it in the chat. We've seen a couple of questions coming that way or raise your hand and I can unmute you if that's easier, but nothing right now, Charlie. Okay, so I wanna go back to the schedule real quick. Okay, so a couple other things just to kind of um, point your attention to this. So there's that repair, right? We saw what happened when I added that back in. Remember, it will require paper trail. I need invoices or receipts to show what the expenses are in order for me to say that they're legitimately the one-time expense. Um, the other things that we get to add back that are paper losses are things like amortization. HOA dues also will be found here on line 19. So if I see some big numbers down here in 19, I'm gonna go look and see if there's anything that I get to add back. So permits and fees, no. Shared expenses, this is interesting. This particular individual has shared expenses on almost every single one of these, and it looks to be they're the same amount. So that's, I, I, would, I would ask what that's for, and potentially there might be something that I can add back, I don't know. But here's some amortization. I could, and I would probably just put this into the, um, into the one-time extraordinary expense column or the depreciation column, it doesn't matter, the math will be the same, but amortization gets to be added back. So that would come into an add back. There's more amortization. So we're gonna take the time, tree service. I don't know, this may be a one-time expense, it depends. Um, and a lot of this, you guys, is really gonna depend on where your debt to income ratio lies at the time. If we know that it's already tight, we are going to, to scrutinize this down to the penny to find every cent that we can, either in additional gain or reduction in loss. Um, yeah, so looking at this, the questions that I would have for this individual is what's the shared expense? What is this for? And if we can find a way to, to add it back or remove it from the overall loss, we're gonna do that. Uh, and like I said, amortization is another one that, that we can always add back. So let me go back up here. Did have a question, Charlie. If sure. any of these are considered one-time expenses, to the to um, to you as a borrower, um, what do you see a lender ask to document to prove it's really a one-time expense? So we're going to want to see invoices or receipts. So um, sometimes the property management company will have ledgers that we can we can probably use, but more often than not, uh, at least an invoice. We'd prefer to have the actual receipt, but the invoice for the work done from you know the contractor or the the plumber or um, right. If, if it was, you know, faulty pipes, I saw a lot of plumber stuff on the, on the, um, statements for this individual. I'd need to see them in order to add them back. Cause sometimes it, it could just be maintenance stuff, not necessarily one time invoices and receipts though, is, is what we're going to, what we're going to ask for. Awesome. Thank you, Joe. Yeah. So let's kind of just keep using this as an example. Um, let's say that this guy now has a mortgage on this property right? And um, he didn't claim, or actually, let's say that the, the CPA did not claim the, the insurance. And I, I, this is another thing that I see all the time that they just omit it, or the borrower doesn't realize that, that they can make the deduction or they forget to give the, ins the CPA uh, the, the binder, the insurance binder that was paid. If it's missed, remember, because this is an add back, but I'm taking it out here, watch what happens when some, if these are not claimed, it's not as if we can go back to underwriting and say, oh, I just forgot to, to submit that to my CPA. If it's not on here, you don't get it. Okay, so watch what happens to our 437 at the bottom. Shaley, sorry. I'm not, I'm not sharing the right screen. Yeah, yep, thank you. Sorry. Sorry, guys. Okay, so there let me go. just go back. So the insurance, right? I'm going to say that... Um, I didn't claim it. I forgot my CPA didn't do it, whatever. What watch what happens to our 437 down below. 239, right? So it's very, very important that you have the appropriate documentation or your, your Schedule E has been reported or filed correctly to give you the maximum in return, in gain, right? We want this to be a positive number and as big as possible. Um, let's go like this. Let's say that the income for this property it was purchased late in the year and there was only $2,500 worth of income. But I'll, I'll change some of these other numbers as well. So I'm just gonna kind of make some stuff up here, guys. Just throw some, some numbers in here. 
appreciation. Okay. So let's just say that this is this is how it was filed, and this is a twelve. Remember, I talked about. I started by talking about this. I started because it, this the return says that it was in service for twelve months. That's a huge loss. Not too many people are going to overcome that big of a loss in their debt to income ratio on one property. Now, if this had been filed correctly and it was only thirty days listed, whoops, I would put one month. What happens to my big loss? Whoops. What do I do here? Your expenses are carried over one month. Oh, sorry, that's sorry, that's, sorry, yeah. sorry, sorry. I didn't. <laughs> oh, yeah, that, that's going to make the difference. That so would I'd be change, a problem, perhaps. I, I changed all these numbers and I didn't change this number. Um, so let's say that this is 14,000, whatever, for everything. I'm still not doing it right. My point is, is that you really need to make sure that this, I, I'm, I'm not thinking of the math correctly, guys. Make sure that when you're looking at your tax return, or better yet, don't even worry about it. Just make sure you send us the draft. And you don't have to remember any of this unless you really want to, and then we'll teach you on a one-on-one -on -one basis. But the point is, is that either you remember the stuff to tell your CPA and make sure that it's correct when it's being filed, or very simply, send us the draft tax return, and we will go through the exercise and tell you what we think your, your best course of action is gonna be. Now, this in this example, let's say that you purchased a property late in the year, um, October, November, December, I'm probably gonna tell you my advice. Unless your DTI is so low, it really doesn't matter. Chances are I'm gonna say, I want that property pulled into 2022 or 2023 in, in current time, All right? If you're purchasing a property like last month, this month and in December, chances are when you file 2022, I'm gonna tell you that the property that was purchased so late in the year, I don't want it on the 2022 return because it's not going to have any income, but you're still going to have all these expenses. It's going to show a loss. I want you to pull it into 2023 because by then we're going to have a full 12 months of income received so that when we do file in 2023, these numbers will look more to your advantage. Jaylee, I just wanted to kind of give you, I think what you were looking for is from a, from a lending perspective, if you only receive 2,500, the point of the return is you don't want that to make it, you don't want the property to look like you've owned that for a full 12 months, right? You want to make sure that your monthly income is relative to how long you've owned it. Correct. That's exactly what it is. So if your CPA just defaults to that 365, I have to use 365 more often than not. Sometimes I can pull a, a rabbit out of a hat and, and convince underwriting to let us use the CD or, or maybe even the old more favorable 75% rule. But my point is, is just be mindful of making sure that this is listed on that that fair rental days of your schedule. E. It's listed correctly and that you haven't omitted or missed any of the other expenses that should be here, especially the ad backs. You guys have any questions? Anybody have any scenarios that you want to run through or other questions about um, tax filings? Remembering that, you know, for those of you that are just getting started, there's gonna be a glass ceiling to what you can deduct on your Schedule E until you can um, claim the real estate professional exemption. We're not gonna get into that today, but at some point when you can claim that exemption, when you've amassed enough properties and you, you meet the benchmarks, um, you're gonna to wanna to get aggressive with your tax deduction, which is fantastic, right? It's kind of like once you've, once you've, you've gotten to that place, you know that you've arrived. When you need as much in the, the tax deduction as possible with your, your rental properties, with your investments, you know that you've, you've met a goal. You've reached that milestone. Because when that's important, or maybe more important than even the cash flow has been, because that's leading up to that, you know you've arrived. So the goal, yes, maximize the tax deductions, but you not, don't want to be so aggressive that it plays you out of qualifying over here. Or maybe you do. Maybe that's part of the strategy. Maybe we max out this year and we don't buy anything new, we're not acquiring, or we use a different product to do so, there's lots of different ways that we can we can attack it. But I want you to be prepared to maximize the deduction without losing qualification if that's the space that you're in. Jaylee, if there is something when you when you do, let's say, let's say uh, someone makes a mistake and they go ahead and that file that return and the, the tax return comes into Ridge Lending Group and it looks like there is just a mistake was made. Is, is the bar able to to uh, refile that, change it, amend it, refile it uh, in the middle of a mortgage application? You can. We don't like that, but I have seen it done. 
It has been done. And, and yes, it, given the circumstance, if we can make a strong enough case for it, yes, it's possible. Awesome. Um, there are no questions coming through, no hands raised as far as I can tell. Uh, did you want to... Uh, oh, I lied. Eddie just snuck a question in, Charlie. And Eddie asks, hey, Charlie, I bought five properties this year. Are they all in New York, Eddie? Is that why we didn't see your loans come through? Uh, in the last 45 days, are you available? I think he's saying, are you available to to give him kudos for buying five properties? I don't know. Eddie, is, is, Eddie your sentence got cut off. Do you want me to unmute you? Uh, I'm going to I'm going to say I'm going to ask Eddie if he wants to unmute. Let's see. It's not unmuting. Maybe he just, maybe his internet cut off. Uh, oh, are you adding to file this in 2020? Or, sorry, yeah. Eddie, you take yourself off mute. Maybe that'll help. Okay. We'll see what we can do about getting Eddie on, uh, yeah. on the line here, advising. Yes, probably, Eddie. I mean, I think, so, okay, what he's asking everybody is that Eddie bought five properties in the last 45 days. Right, so October, November, December, um, and he's saying, "Am I advising?" He pulls those into the 2023 versus filing them on 2022. Maybe, depending on where your debt to income ratio is, otherwise, maybe that does make sense. If we're wanting to qualify for acquisition in 2023, that's going to be key. If that has, if you have plans to do that, chances are better than not that I'm going to say yes. Pull those into 2023. Keep them off the 2022 year because two things are gonna happen. One, it's gonna build up 12 months worth of income for those properties so that when we do file the 2023 return, those properties are gonna look great from the Schedule E, but then also it's gonna allow us to continue to use that more favorable, easy 75% of the gross rents formula for the whole year of, of 2023, right? We get to keep using 75% gross rents until that property falls on a Schedule E. The minute you file the property on a Schedule E, the acquisition your formula is no longer available to that property. It will always then live on the Schedule E for calculating the income. And as you guys can see from that worksheet that I shared, that's a complicated formula, right? The adds and the subtracts and the divisions and what we can add back and what we can't. The Schedule E is, is far more complex. And it's a, a lot of times, at least within the first few years of ownership, you're probably going to see a very, very small gain from an underwriting perspective, not reality, not what you're making in reality, but from underwriting perspective, you're probably going to see a very, very small gain, if not even a loss for the first few years of ownership until those properties stabilize. So the acquisition year formula up to 75% of the gross rents minus the PITI is really going to be more to our debt to income ratios advantage. Now, I do want to stress that, of course, Charlie, you are not a tax professional. Thank you, Larry. You're not an attorney. You know, this is this is advice that Jaylee is sharing with everybody from her perspective as a lender of of uh, 30 years plus. Um, so definitely, uh, Eddie, especially because you're in New York, please check with your uh, professionals that can guide you from a legal and from a tax purpose perspective. Uh, a couple of questions rolled in, Jaylee. Uh, Harding wants to know, does this approach also apply to cash out refinancing? Um, Harding, it's going to apply to any property that will be listed on your Schedule E. So whether it's, yeah, if, it, if it's a cash out refi, sir, um, chances are it's on your Schedule E already. If it's a purchase, then no, it wouldn't be there. But unless you just recently purchased, purchased it or before that year's tax return could be or has been filed, yes, this would apply to a, a refinance of a rate and term or cash out. The, the, the purpose of the refi isn't going to be as relevant as the refi itself. If it's on the Schedule E, it's, it does apply, yes. This wasn't a question asked, but I'm going to interpret something for Harding's situation. And other people might have this too, Charlie. We see this where sometimes borrowers take a primary or a second home and they convert it to an investment property. Does that count in that tax year or what do they do for that? So I'm assuming in that case, it did not fall on the Schedule E. So you Correct. owned it and you lived in it, right? You made it a rental and you moved into another primary. You bought another primary. In that case, we're going to use 75% of the gross rents. We'll, we'll, we'll do it as if it was a new purchase or in the acquisition year. 
until that tax return has been filed, that year's tax return has been filed, at which point you wanna list the income. That kind of leads me to something else really quickly. So I do see clients come through where they've got family members that maybe their mom or their dad or their brother are living in a rental and they don't claim the income. Maybe the, the family member or the friend or whoever it is, is, is paying them just enough to cover the mortgage and they, they don't think they, they can or, or should or need to claim it, that's wrong. You need to claim it. If you're receiving the income, you should be claiming it and taking the deductions as appropriate. Because otherwise, if you don't have anything, the loss is going to be the full PITI, right? Rarely will the Schedule E, rarely will the Schedule E present a loss that is in excess of the full mortgage payment. And we've okay. seen that, Charlie, right? In Lunds, I mean, we've seen her where the there's the property's been owned and there's been no rent collected and it's caused us some trouble in qualifying. Sure. Or there's rent collected, but they just haven't claimed it. And I mean, I guess, I guess if you're not collecting rent and you still want to claim it and the IRS gets a little bit more, more money and it helps you qualify by all means, go for it. Again, not tax advice. I'm not giving you tax advice. I'm just saying, people do. I don't think the IRS would have a problem with you saying that. If they're getting more money. <laughs> well, this is on the internet, Jalen. It will live forever. So, okay. you know, we just want to make sure. I'll, I'll uh, get a knock on the door. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, uh, Kyle, um, so as, we, as we're wrapping up today, uh, and this has been great information, there is a, a question that I think leads into something, Jalen, you and I talked right before the start of this call, which was, you know, it's end of the year, cost segregation ties into um, properties and decisions. So Kyle Smith came back and asked, if, if he pays for a cost segregation study on seven properties, should Kyle claim all of that initial depreciation this year or spread it out between the tax years of 22 and 23? Do you have any thoughts on that? So Kyle, I think this is going to be really subjective to your qualifications today. I mean, if we can spread it out, I'd say spread it out, right? If you have a, a lot of properties and you need that deduction to, to minimize some of your taxes, then, then maybe you do it now. But and what is your DTI now? Um, so uh, it'd be nice to just grab it all, but maybe keeping it and, and parsing it out over the next couple of years is more to your advantage. I think that's going to be very um, subjective to the individual's qualifications and then long-term goals. I don't think that answers your question, except to say, if you don't have an application and get it in and, and I'll tell you exactly what I think. I love that follow-up, right? Now that none of this really matters unless you need to borrow money. Sure. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, great points. Thank you, Kyle, for that question. Uh, Chaley, so uh, again, just to kind of touch in, uh, enforce the topic here. So it's November 8th, election day. Hopefully everybody got out to do their civic duty I vote. I did. Um, you know, we've only got five weekends left to Christmas. If you celebrate Christmas, Jesus. you believe that? I don't. Uh, and we only have six weeks left, theoretically, of the year we're seeing a lot of clients come in who are trying to get their houses closed this year, specifically to take advantage of cost segregation. Um, what are your thoughts? I know every year there's an end of the year push. We're pretty much at that edge now, aren't we? We really are. Um, and I've been trying to scream it from the rooftops uh, as loud as I can for anyone who will listen. Um, I'm going to say it to you guys here. Hopefully you've already heard me say this and it is a repeat, but if you have any, any intention or ambition to get in a refinance uh, or a purchase or whatever it is for for whatever reason, tax purposes or otherwise, you really need, and you haven't gotten your ducks in a row yet, you need to do it, not tomorrow, like today, like tonight, get an application in. Um, the reason for this, you guys, is, is that Ridge is, is unique in what we do, right? The non-owner occupied. The rest of our industry between usually around November 1st until after the first of the year, they're, they're on hiatus, right? Everybody's taking little little breaks, little naps, because it's just the slowest time for them. Most of them are working on the owner-occupied side. Well, for us, we have a whole surge of, of extra volume at the last part of the year. We have vacations. We've got short months with the holidays. We have skeleton crews because everybody's gone. So from underwriters to uh, originators to processors to appraisers, insurance, all of our industry is, is kind of taking a break. So the turn times, it, for all of those reasons, I would tell you, if you want to do something this year, you have no time to lose. You need to get moving right away. Awesome. Charlie, it's been another great time. Again, for anybody, if you're looking to get, apply, just go to ridgelendinggroup.com. If you have any questions for Charlie or anybody else at the dedicated lending specialist at Ridge Lending Group, you can email into info at ridgelendinggroup.com or just pick up the phone call anytime you want. 
855-74-RIDGE. Chaley, thank you as always. Everybody, thank you for coming today. Thanks, guys. Good to see you all. See you next week.